baseball is back. That sweet smell of the grass. Oh, smell that green grass. <laughs> Just sweet sound of the bat. Sweet, sweet crack of the bat. Man, it should be back. And most of you cardboard stands are probably wanting to know just how to prospect. Well, my friends, today we are gonna be peeling back the onion layers on prospecting. Regardless, if you are looking for those shiny new refractors of the next hot stud teenager in Bowman Chrome, or looking for those shiny zebra parallels and panini prism of your favorite future strip club baller, whatever your flavor, these same principles are going to apply. Now I've been prospecting for a long time, starting out in 2005 with Justin Upton, all the way up to the latest crop of prospects hitting your fresh overpriced packs from Pupini and Tops today. Along the way I've won, I've lost, but each and every attempt I've learned something new. So today, as we journey through the underworlds of prospecting, I want to accomplish three things with you. One, define what exactly prospecting is as it relates to sports cards, just so that everyone is on the same page. Two, classify the three different types of prospectors across a variety of domains. And third, provide examples of current players and how those players' profiles would be categorized based on risk, reward, profitability, etc. So, my little cardboard friends, let's jump into it. But before we do, I please ask that you all help me fight the good fight by clicking the thumbs up or subscribing so that we can combat the sewer of cardboard content flooding the YouTube airways. It is increasingly becoming a problem, and trust me, if you don't, consider yourself a rusty cunts. When we think of the world of prospecting, prospecting can be defined as the act of acquiring specific players' cards or memorabilia with the expectation that the card's memorabilia will increase in value at some point in time in the future. The key points being specific players expected to increase in value in the future. This is essentially speculation. Again, nothing really wrong with this at all. That speculation typically occurs because a prospector expects that player to perform well or other variables are taken into consideration that may lead to an increase in price at some point in the future. Because of this expectation and speculation, prospectors can be broadly classified into three different types. And I've named them very simply, type one, type two, and type three. And what are we gonna do for the majority of the video is break down the differences in these types of prospectors and how they operate in the sports card marketplace. It is worth noting that in general, as we move along looking at type one prospectors to type two to type three, you generally lose a level of sophistication. Type three prospectors are typically less knowledgeable. They aren't in the weeds of their specific player. They're typically much more emotional in their decision making, whereas type ones are usually much more data driven, or at least in the weeds. Think of type one prospectors as those who get in the absolute earliest that you can get in. If a new Bowman Chrome product comes out or a new basketball or football product comes out with all the new shiny rookies, these types of prospectors already know who they are going after. The type three people are the last ones to get on the boat. And before we progress through the series, I want to point out all prospector types can be successful. In some examples, there are players that afford the prospector the ability to make money for each and every prospector type. There are others, and the vast majority of them, are such that only type 1 prospectors make money. As the players flame out before a type 2 or type 3 can see any profits, so type 2s and certainly type 3s are often the ones holding the bags on failed prospects, but it's a distinction that I want to point out. So when we think about the different types of prospectors, let's go through these using some real-world examples and categorize them as it relates to risk. Type 1 prospectors, by and large, but have the least risk. Now, there is a lot of uncertainty with type 1 prospectors. However, the risk is the lowest because the buy-in prices are the lowest for any given player. Now, yes, players flame out and 99.9% .9 of the cards go to zero. But think of the examples that I'm giving and pay attention to the concept, please. Using Mike Trout as an example, if you were buying his 2009 Bowman Chrome Draft Chrome Autograph, rookie at release, you were paying $10 per card. Maybe 15 maybe 20 but 10 bucks. Blue refractors could be had for under 100 maybe 120 but mainly 100 bucks. I'd call that not really risky. Now, type 2 prospector isn't as savvy as type 1. They aren't really identifying that player on the checklist and buying early at launch. They're either, one, waiting for the data to come out, or two, 
They have their head up in the sand and are waiting for other people to tell them what to buy. Basically, they are on the fence. A type 2 prospector would have bought Mike Trout in 2010 or 2011 pre-call-up right around when he was named the number one prospect in baseball and Baseball America's Minor League Player of the Year over superstar Bryce Harper, who is a super prospect, and was the hobby darling for which Mike Trout stole the reins from unexpectedly. So those type 2 folks were waiting for the official publications to create content. They were waiting on the accolades to show up. They were waiting for AA performance. Whatever the case, they weren't early. The type 3 Mike Trout buyer showed up in 2012, and Mike put up incredible numbers as a rookie, 30 home runs, 49 stolen bases, and of course, one rookie of the year. So as you can imagine, as we use Mike Trout as an example, a type 1 prospector in this example paid a significantly lower price to acquire Mike Trout rookie cards than a type 2 prospector. But that type 2 prospector likely acquired those cards at a lower price than a type 3 prospector. Now, every player goes through the ups and downs, and by and large, more often than not, prospects do in fact decrease in value after being called up to the majors after the initial buzz following the call up, and that's due to low performance. So there are some examples of great opportunities to buy when a player gets called up and then struggles immediately. Such was the case even with Mike Trout in 2011 when he was first called up. There were amazing buying opportunities for those that believed, and those that did so were rewarded handsomely. Whether those are type 2s or type 3s or simply just keen opportunists, I'll let you all be the judge. But these are simple, simply general broad classifications. Now let's categorize each of these in terms of types. So are type 1, type 2, type 3 prospectors more so flippers? Are they investors or are they collectors? Well, if you think about it, a type 1 prospector buying Mike Trout in 2009, unless the buyer actually knows Mike Trout, went to school with him, knows the family, or they're a diehard, super duper diehard Angels fan who knows the minor leagues closely and follows them closely, or is just a minor league baseball nerd, more than likely, the people buying are not collecting Mike Trout because Mikey hasn't really done anything at this point. So by and large... Most type 1s are going to be classified as flippers. Again, nothing wrong with that. It just is what it is. Now, type 2s also fall into the same bucket, but now they are starting to cross over into the investor bucket. Some of these guys, again, not super sophisticated, they saw a sudden surge in pricing because Mike did something and is popping off in the minors. They might want to stash away some cards for a longer-term play or just maybe ride a wave and try to flip higher. That takes you into the type 3s. These guys, more than likely, are not just flipping, but buyers here are buying most players at their absolute peak. Now, we all know 2012 was not Mike's absolute peak. It's because he then carried baseball and baseball card world for a decade. But most players, if you buy them during your rookie year, you are buying at the top. So the people who are likely jumping on the wagon during the time frame, this time frame are going to be collectors of the team or investors who are speculating on even further future success of that player. To me, this is clearly why I classify this as high risk, as the majority of these players have already seen their largest gains well before being called up. And at call up, you're now finding suckers to hold your bags and pay you money. So, how about how we classify the prospector types based on different data needs? Now, I know many of you are thinking, if you're data junkies like me, the more data that is out there, the easier it is for you to make any given decision. And that's going to conflict with my risk classification at the top. Well, you can't look at risk without factoring in buy-in price. But when we look only at data, type 1 prospectors typically have the least amount of data to go off of. There's going to be scouting reports for every player. There may be high school data for which it's impossible to use as a predictive tool. There may be college data, which is a little bit better for predictive tool. And there may be less than two to three months of low-level minor league ball. For other sports like basketball and football, there may be college stats. Other sources of data for baseball include Team USA stats, summer league stats like Cape Cod League, maybe some showcase data. But the real juice is actual live game professional competition. That trumps all. And that's what moves the markets. Speaking of moving markets, your type 2 prospector is usually an avid market mover subscriber. They don't really have the sophistication to learn how to prospect uh, a specific sport. They may be new. They may not understand the sport. So they purchase tools to help them so that when the market does in fact move, they can begin searching for those names and researching. This is a problem 
because by this time, these Type 2 flippers have already missed the boat. The ship has sailed, and those Type 1s are already rolling their profits over into the next purchases, rinse and repeat, while the Type 2 is left waiting. So Type 2s need more data because they aren't keeping up with or aren't comfortable jumping in yet. Type 3s, of course, are not sophisticated whatsoever, and they usually jump in at the shiny new toy when the player's name pops up on ESPN, either on a talk show or a highlight segment. And of course, by that time, hype has maxed out and everyone knows the player's name. They're not hidden anymore and prices are inevitably going to be high. So going back on a different topic that I touched on earlier, each of those prospector types has a different requirement as to whether the player is truly a can't-miss player. So if you are a Type 1 prospector and you bought Jesus Montero in 2008 Bowman Chrome Draft and snagged a few of his autographs for $30 at release, you likely successfully prospected Jesus by flipping them to Type 2s. Type 2 prospectors, assuming they bought after Jesus was ranked a top three prospect in 2009 going into 2010 may have been successful but probably didn't eat as good as a type one now if they sold immediately after jesus hit two home runs in yankee stadium then they did good but any yankee fan will tell you that if they had they as a type three prospector bought into jesus post call up they likely lost every single bit of their buy-in price because montero cards now are completely worthless so this highlights that type 1 prospectors don't necessarily require the player to make it. They just have to play well in the minors. Type 3 prospectors require the player to make it, which is why the majority of rookie logo guys are complete trash. Most of them don't make it. Separate topic for another day. Lots of juicy thoughts ready to set the internet ablaze, but that you will have to wait. Let's go through some specific examples of players, but before we do, I've got another little fun jingle to play for you guys and a takeaway from local sports radio in Kentucky, the Kentucky Sports Radio Podcast. Ellie De La Cruz, Ellie De La Cruz, Cincinnati Phenom, have you heard the news? Fastest man alive, short top six foot five, this red he cannot lose. Ellie, Ellie De, La De La Cruz, Cruz hits the ball really, 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 really hard. I'm thinking you probably want to have his rookie card. Find a 52 mantle and you won't sing the blues. Or a 2023 Ellie De La Cruz, a cycle in just his 15. Game is what he gave us. Last cycle for the Reds in '89 was Eric Davis. They both were 44. I'm not sure who you choose. Davis, he was great, but I take Ellie De La Cruz. Ellie De La Cruz. Ellie De La Cruz. On a routine grounder, better you don't snooze. He'll outrun the cheetah in the Cincinnati Zoo. Have you heard the news? Ellie De La Cruz. Ellie De La Cruz. Ellie De La Cruz, Dominican Republic is where he paid his dues. The Reds, they are on fire, and Ellie is the fuse. Have you heard the news? Ellie De La Cruz. How great is that song? I've never heard that. That's the best yeah, song that's ever it. existed, and it'll get in your he- ear, and I'm telling you, when it gets up to hit today, you're going to go, Ellie De La Cruz. But the key story is Ellie learned to speak English. Did you see that video? Loved it. How can you not love that guy? Yeah. He was like, I want fans to connect to me, so I learned to speak English. Yep. And I just thought that was the neatest video. Me too. Like, if he's good this year, he could be like the face of baseball, don't you think? I mean, I know I'm biased because I'm a Reds fan, but, like, isn't he such a likable dude? Very likable guy. And I saw what was the story. Like, he spent all the offseason learning, perfecting his English so he could do this. Shannon, I know you're not a Reds fan. Do you like Ellie? You oh like yeah, the- yeah. I mean, it was cool that uh, he hit the cy- hit for the cycle when I was at the game. That even was the though game I was a Braves you were there. Fan. Yeah. I sold my tickets to you. I gave my tickets That's to right. you, and you got to see the cycle. Yeah. That's right. So I mean, he's. I, I think he's right up there with Otani as the best player in the game. Well, <laughs> you, Ronald Acuna? Uh, what'd you there. say? He's not there yet. I mean, I, he's gonna I, have to. I mean, Acuna. I yeah. There. I mean, I think you know, top five. Yeah, he's he's the most excited. When, when everybody is, is around and we're swinging for two long bombs away, how, how do we come around to know, man, this really, this really is what, it, what it's for? Yeah. Are you high right now? What? What was that? Is that a question? 
Now that, my friends, is why prospecting is so great. I think Ellie De La Cruz absolutely sucks. But others think he may be the best player in baseball. And this, my friends, is what makes the world of prospecting go round and round. Now you all might say that I'm a hypocrite. Eh, you might be right. But you are all lawyer viewers of the channel. You saw me spend thousands and thousands of dollars on Ellie. Yes, you are correct. I successfully type one prospected Ellie de la Cruz, and I flipped all of those Ellie's to type two buyers with the exception of a handful of high-end items that I ended up flipping to type three bag holders. Yes, Ellie was a huge success for me, and I loved him in the minors, but never saw him projecting well as a big leaguer. Why? Well, if you really want to know why, it's probably going to cost you a little bit of money through a future membership, not giving out all my juice for free. Lemons cost money, amigos. But now that Ellie is a big leaguer, I wouldn't touch his cards with a 10-foot pole. Now, maybe that changes. Maybe new data emerges to influence my decision. You know time doesn't stand still or go backwards. It keeps moving forward. And as it moves forward, new data emerges. But as it stands today, I'm a hard sell on Ellie. Well, what about a football guy? How about old Patty Cakes, Patrick Mahomes? Well, if you were a true type 1 prospector, you would have bought Mahomes in 2017. I'm sorry, I was not one of those people. I wasn't even doing football cards routinely in 2017. I was too busy chasing around Acuna, Soto, Vladdy, Mike Trout, some of the basketball prospects, anything but football. Fast forward to 2018. I watched my first patty cake game week 4 after seeing he was leading the National Football League with 10 touchdowns as essentially a rookie. And the rest was history. I hopped on that type to paddy wagon so hard, I now consider myself the paddy wagon conductor, and it is all bored, choo choo, ever since. So much so that now, if you're buying Patrick Mahomes, you aren't type one prospecting him, you aren't even type two prospecting him. We know what Mahomes is. He is already a top three all time great with a shot at being number one. I think he's number one already based on my eye test, which is the same eyes that told me to go all in on this guy week four of 2018, which has rewarded me handsomely for that decision. But if you were buying now, you are really investing or you're collecting the Kansas City Chiefs hard, which makes you a type three prospector. So one more deck to go through, and this really breaks down some examples of players and where they currently are or were as to how you would be classified as a prospector if you bought their cards today or at some point in the past if stated on the slide. So again, type one prospectors get in early. They have the least risk. The player doesn't need to make it. They're usually the smartest and the savviest, but it's also worth noting, and I haven't mentioned this yet, they usually make the least on a per successful flip basis, but it's steady and it's predictable, and it's repeatable, and thus it's fun. Type two prospectors have a little more risk, have a little higher buy-in, wait for more data, or they buy it because they can't find it on their own, would try to ride the hot waves and sell before the wave crashes. Type three prospectors are usually investor types or collectors who are probably more pure in this hobby than anyone else, especially if they are the collector types. They probably just enjoy cards for what they are, and that's the part of the hobby I would love to see grow. Not because I want to see them holding my bags, although that would be nice, but because the cohort is the only sustainable group to keep this hobby alive and thriving. If those cats disappear, the hobby dies. Alrighty, now all of you little ninos and ninos who watch this can go successfully, go prospecting. Don't go losing all your money out there now. Let's go.